On the instructions of Gurudev and by his sweet mercy, we continue our reading of Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila, Chapter 4, by Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, in the translation from the Bengali, by and with the commentary by um, Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. We read in order to join the flow of feeling and love that comes from and through our parampara, immediately through Gurudev. So let's put our minds into that place, and mostly let's put our, our hearts into that place so that we can listen and, and understand and do the strange thing that we call understanding through the heart. It's been two weeks since we last met. So let me just uh, remind of the remind you of the the of our foundation, the foundation that we built the last times. The first is that this is Chaitanya Charitamrita is a very special biography. A biography of a man, but also a biography of a soul. And strangely, as we saw last time, it's two biographies that happen at the same time. So we have Lord Chaitanya in a material form, but relating constantly to his own spiritual consciousness. Uh, an experience that we have difficulties imagining. So it's perfect Krishna consciousness in the sense that it's a sadhaka, it's a devotee, Chaitanya is a devotee, and Chaitanya is Krishna, the one to whom devotion is given at the same time. And we talked last time about what that ecstasy must mean, and we'll talk more about it, I think, today when we read our verses. You remember that Chaitanya Charitamrita is a, a long biography. It has three parts. The Adi Lila, which Adi means simply beginning, and Madhya Lila, which means middle, and Antya Lila, which means and and what we see also in the commentary of Srila Prabhupada is that Chaitanya Charitamrita um, is always expressed in relation to Bhagavad Gita. That means there there are um, quotations from Bhagavad Gita, but also the very ideas from Bhagavad Gita that we've learned in our Bhagavad Gita class, they're coming, and always in relation to Srimad Bhagavatam, the stories of the pastimes of Krishna. And everywhere in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, starting with the six Goswamis, the references for our ideas come from Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam. So, for example, if you read Jiva Goswami, who's kind of the philosopher of Gaudiya, of the Gaudiya line, he builds everything he says on Bhagavatam. So he won't tell, he won't try to tell you anything that he doesn't say is already said in Bhagavatam. So it's very nice to to both keep Bhagavad Gita in mind and Srimad Bhagavatam in mind, but also to to look at them and study them when we have the 
the time and the occasion. Um, Adi Lida, Ali Lila chapter four is entitled The Confidential Reasons for the Lord's Appearance. And we've come to understand that confidential here means not secret, a secret that we're not allowed to tell. It means that it's unknown to those who are living in their minds, that these reasons come from the heart. The reasons for Lord Chaitanya's appearance are spiritual reasons. And so we mustn't try to reduce them to logical arguments. They're reasons which link to Krishna's own desires, to how he understands himself, to how he <clears throat> experiences emotion, It's an expression of his personality. You remember that Srila Prabhupada, maybe most strongly, but others too, described Bhagavan, Krishna, as a personality. And this is so very important for us to understand that personality means that there's feeling, that there's form, there's shape, there's variation, there's experience. So God is not impersonal. God is not just the totality of the world, what we call Brahman. God is not just the totality of all souls, which we call Paramatma but he's also a personality. I want to say she's also a personality because, of course, we venerate Radha more strongly than Mohan. So chapter four is about this internal spiritual longing that drives Krishna to take the body of uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And we've said it many times, but chapter three, the chapter before, was about the external reasons, the reasons he did for others, for us. And that reason was primarily one, in order to reveal to us prema bhakti, to reveal to us that our innermost nature, our most fundamental nature, is to love God and to understand, to give us the understanding that we are all capable of this. So when we're reading through chapter 4, which is written, it's terribly beautiful, which is so beautiful, in to the, to today's verses you'll see that, we can always remember that what... Krishna experiences in this confidential reasons, the feelings he has, the longing he has, the desire he has, is also a desire for us, for his devotees. It's an external desire as well as being an internal desire. And this, this relationship between his external desire and his internal desire is what translates into his ecstasy. By ecstasy, we mean this experience of feeling that's so strong that he nearly explodes. And people in his time observed it in his body and his way of acting. So he was both an external 
devotee. He preached, he explained, he was a Sanskrit scholar. He was apparently a very kind and merciful man. And internally, he was feeling this endless need and want to, to love Krishna. So more than anybody in all of history, he gave himself. And by this we understand that he gave his soul. He experienced this terribly strong emotional longing for devotion to Krishna. And then he went through the material world and shared this with others. So we could call this generosity. And in the morning class, maybe two weeks ago, we discussed the, 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 the idea called Audarya, which is, and which I wrote about in a, in a blog post this idea of spiritual generosity. That we, in Western society, we grow up and our parents tell us it's very nice to give. It's very nice to help others. It's very nice to use your resources so that other people can be happy too. So in a material way, we learn that giving is, is good. But this giving is material giving, and it is good. We give some money, we give some time, we give some uh, work. But what brings our dear Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to the next level is that he gives his soul. He gives all of himself all of his inner energy, his inner being, he gives it to his devotees. This is a very deep subject that we'll, we'll discuss another time because we want to continue now our reading. But that is essentially the, the beauty of Chaitanya Charitamrita, that he is both a source of endless love for God in his heart. And he's a man who walks in the world and wants to give this to, to those who listen to him. We'll come back to this in a moment in verse 27. First, let me remind you what we discussed last time. We, were, we read last time four verses. In verse 23, um, now Krishna, through all these verses from verse 23, Krishna is speaking to us, narrated in, in, uh, in Chaitanya Charitamrita. So there are about 12 verses where he's speaking directly to us, Krishna. And in verse 23, he was speaking about his feelings. And he was speaking about the gopis' feelings too. The verse took us back to the scene in the Rasa Lila, where Krishna is dancing with the gopis. And then, if you remember the story, Krishna suddenly leaves and the gopis are, of course, very sad. And they're sad in part, just like you and I are sad in part, because we don't understand our feelings. I feel things and you feel things, I know, that you don't understand. 
and this makes us sad or anxious. That's what the gopis were feeling. They gave all their love to Krishna. And he left. And they don't, they don't understand. Why did he leave? So in a kind of spiritual sense, they were saying, what is my love about? Why does, what does my love mean? And Krishna comes to them in Dvaraka and he says, I understand. I understand your suffering. I understand you're worried. And please know that I will return. And then the important part was, I will return because I am your servant. And why is Krishna the servant of the devotee? because of the devotion. So the message of verse 23 was, if you are devotee to me, if you are loving me, I will become a devotee to you. Verses 24, 25, and 26 were about three of the different kinds of bhav that we talk about in Gaudiya Vaishnavism. The first one was, in verse 24, was vatsalya bhav. So the motherly emotion, motherly love. And we understood that Krishna saw the gopis in a motherly way. And we made, or I made um, a point that what motherly love means, what matsalya bhav means, vatsalya bhav means, is caring for a helpless material being caring for a, a baby or a child who is very vulnerable from a material point of view, while at the same time understanding that the soul of the child or the baby is perfection itself. Vatsali above, motherly love, means realizing the difference between a helpless, <clears throat> a vulnerable, bod vulnerable body, which a baby is, and a vulnerable soul, which a baby is not. It means seeing the perfection of the child's soul <clears throat> through the vulnerability of the child's body. That is Vatsalya Bhav. Verse 25 talked about Sakya Bhav, the, the mood of friendship. And we found out that Sakya Bhav means seeing one, on, one another equally. Seeing your soul when I look at you as much as you see my soul. And then finally, in verse 26, we talked about Madhurya Bhav, our sweet Madhurya Bhav. Madhurya is sweet, of course, because it means sweetness, doesn't it? This is the mood of lovers. We say of conjugal love, but at least in English language, in my language, this means married love, and that doesn't need to be the case. 
But Madhurya love is the most intimate relation that can happen between two souls. And there was this very sweet um, comment in the verse by, by Krishna, who says that, well, if, if my lover, if my beloved looks at me with sadness or in a bad mood or grumpy, or, I'm all the more in love with her because... Why? Because it leads me away from the reverent mood. It leads me away from Vaidhi Bhakti. It leads me away from respect for God out of fear and leads me toward love for God out of the heart. And it's funny because the verse does not name Radha, but it, I, it seems clear and many commentaries say that this is referring to Radha. So when what, um, what Krishna calls natural love comes, love that comes spontaneously from the soul, then it's higher than the, than the, the opulent, opulence of God. When true love comes, when love that's unconditional from the heart comes, it's higher than God. It makes God into a servant. It makes God into a devotee. This is why Mohan becomes a devotee of Radha. This is why Lord Chaitanya in his material life even though he's a great scholar and a powerful teacher, he is the most humble devotee of Krishna. The highest consequence of love is to become the servant. So finally, the last word about last time then, This discovery of natural love, so-called natural love, spontaneous love, love that comes without any reason, this is the key to understanding everything about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's life. The internal reasons for coming, that he wanted to feel what it is to love God, external reasons for coming that he wanted to share divine love with everyone to distribute prema prema bhakti together these make the miracle of chaitanya why it's very simple and it's <laughs> I'm sorry, it's infinitely deep. Why does that make the reason for Chaitanya? Because it says the highest love is nothing if we do not give it. It means that the highest thing in the universe is giving love, love in action, as our dear Gurudev says. Love is not love if it's not given. Love is not love if it's not um, put to work, if it's not put into action. So that says that giving love, or let's say this way, Love that is given is higher than the idea of love. So don't talk to me about love. Show me how you love.
Don't be a philosopher of love. Be a lover. Krishna was the absolute idea of love, is the absolute idea of love. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was love given. I'm sorry I talk in past. He is love given. Loving is higher than love. Which is why Radha is higher than Mohan. Okay, all these ideas will come back now again and again. Let's move on to verses 27 and 28. 27, 28, they are uh, collected together in the in Chaitanya Charitamita in the in our edition, in Prabhupada's edition. Krishna is still talking or maybe thinking and we're we're listening to his thoughts. Um, and he's continuing what he was thinking in the last verse, 26. And he's continuing on, on this theme of what spontaneous love is, a natural love. Why he wants to experience it and why he wants to share this experience. So here is the verse. Ai shudha bhakta lana karima avutara kariba vivada vida abuta vihara vaikuntadya nahi yeye lilare prechara se se lila kariba yate muro chamatkara. And Prabhupada translates this way. Taking these pure devotees with me, I shall descend and sport in various wonderful ways, unknown even in Vaikuntha. I shall broadcast such pastimes by which even I am amazed. So there's so much to talk about in this verse. It's very rich. And now Zoom is saying that my English is so bad that it's wondering whether I'm speaking English. But I'll say yes. Actually, it's a, it's curious because Shuddha Bhakta is singular. One perfect devotee. I should bhakti the, the 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 perfect devotee, but Prabhupada translates it in plural. He says, "Taking these pure devotees." I can't explain this, but let let us respect it that he has his reasons, and let's keep this in our minds. But literally, the verse says, "I will descend as a pure devotee." And Prabhupada says, taking these pure devotees with me, I shall descend. We don't need to have a academic discussion about it, but it's very interesting that, that this happens. So Shuddha Bhakta is a pure devotee. And we know that Lord Chaitanya was a pure devotee, a perfect devotee, so humble, so caring and so uh, uh, devotional, let's just say. So I shall descend karimu avatara. I will be an avatar. I will take a body. Yes. And then he will spread his pastimes, his lila. It says prachara, so he'll preach them 
he will he will preach them, he will spread them wherever they are not being preached. Nahi ye lilara prachara. Wherever my pastimes are not being preached, I will preach them. So anybody who doesn't know about me, I will tell them about me. And then the most extraordinary part of the verse is the very last bit. I'm going to tell about these pastimes, the pastimes that even surprise me. He says, I shall broadcast such pastimes by which even I am amazed. He's amazed by his own pastimes, as though he didn't even know he was going to do them. So the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is a surprise to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So how do we, how do we understand this? This is a way of expressing the spontaneous love we talk about, the natural love, the Raganuga love. Pure love is spontaneous. Pure love has no cause. If you give me reason to love you, then it's not love. If I understand why I love you, it's not love. If I have any benefit of loving you, it's not love. The blessing that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives us is love that we do not understand. And I think this, this is true for all emotions. Every day we we experience emotions that we understand. I know I'm afraid of snakes, so I see a snake and I have an emotion. That is not a pure emotion. That's a reaction. In psychology, it's called a behavior. But sometimes, and for us sadhakas, not very often, but sometimes, everyone's experienced an emotion that comes without a cause. Suddenly I feel, maybe it's, maybe it's a nice emotion, maybe it's a dark emotion, but I feel and I don't know why. This is the surprise. This is the astonishment that Chaitanya is talking about. It's a pure experience of the soul, which has no cause, just like mercy has no cause. We feel something without a cause. You can't explain it. No, no amount of scientists, no university education will help you. You feel something without a cause. And these feelings that come now and then from time to time, these need to be the center of our attention, the center of our focus, because this is the purest part of our souls coming through. This is the inner energy of our souls, the pleasure-giving energy, the Radha Shakti coming through saying, I am here, not because you deserve it, not because you caused it, but because, just because. <laughs> and this is why we say in some verses of Chaitanya Charitamrita that prema, 
divine love is like a person unto itself. It has its own life. No one can guide it. No one can buy it. No one can give it. It simply comes. Prema is the boss. Prema, love for the divine, is higher even than the divine. Again, and that's why Radha, we say, is higher than Mohan. Because she's the energy of giving love. And so this verse tells us that, well, Chaitanya wants to share this. And so he appears as a pure devotee. He appears so that he can understand his own feelings, so that he can put himself in the position of Radha and understand the feelings of one who loves God, but also so that he can be a servant to us and give us these feelings too. But we can also talk a little bit more, I think, about the Viraj Leela, the Vrindavan Leela that we read in Vilapakus Manjari and Radha Rasa Sudaniti and other books. Because there we see a whole world of emotions. that Mohan, Krishna, has to um, relate to. They surprise him. He's surprised. What will Radha do now? How can I get her love? How can I better enjoy her? It's as though the nature of bhakti comes to him in the in the Vrindavan Leelas. He's the servant of the lover, of Radha, who's there to show him what love is, and he is surprised by it. This is what Krishna is saying in this verse. I am astonished by my own Leelas. So let's hear what Prabhupada says now to this verse. He's going to give us some more practical, a bit more practical um, point of view. He says this, Lord Krishna, in the form of Lord Chaitanya, educates his devotees to develop progressively to the stage of pure devotional service. Lord Krishna, in the form of Lord Chaitanya, educates his devotees. So Chaitanya, he came to preach. In the middle of his confidential experiences of love, he spent his life preaching traveling throughout India and preaching. But what is remarkable, remarkable about his life is that even though he was a great scholar, it's written about how good he was with Sanskrit language and poetry, the teaching he did was by showing. by Nam San Kirtan, by, by ecstatic singing and Kirtan and dancing. So when he wasn't preaching, he was ecstatically showing what it is like to be in the situation of this divine love.
So he both preached and he showed. And at least in the in his time, in his generation, what he showed was much stronger. And then he taught the Goswamis and others too, and they wrote many books in order to help with the preaching. So, I'm sorry, Prabhupada goes on now. Thus, he appears periodically as a devotee to take part in various wonderful activities depicted means described, depicted in his sublime philosophy and teachings. So Chaitanya already had all the ideas, but the meaning of his life was not to, was less to give the ideas than to show through his wonderful activities, as Prabhupada says. So we know that this is not a problem. We know that Krishna is perfect knowledge. We know that Krishna is all beauty, all splendor. But what we don't know before Chaitanya is what it feels like. So Chaitanya's primary mission is to show, to live. To embody, that's the word, embody the truth of the soul. Embody the truth of the, of the world. To be an actor, we say. To do love in action, as Gurudev says. So what does he do? At least in the first half of his life, he's a devotee. And he shows us what a devotee, a pure devotee, does. He's a humble servant. He's a humble servant of Krishna, but at the same time he is Krishna. This is the miracle of his life. And this is where we need to talk a little bit about um, this very important philosophical idea, which is called Achintya Bheda Bheda. Achintya Bheda Bheda. I wouldn't talk about it too much because it can be complicated. But it's so important for understanding Lord Chaitanya that we should have some idea about it. It's usually translated like this inconceivable union of sameness and difference. So, achintya means inconceivable, can't understand it, impossible to understand, achintya. Beda means difference, and abeda is the opposite of difference, so sameness. Difference and sameness are together. It's a perfect contradiction. It's like saying, my name is Udav and my name is Gauda. It's a contradiction. It can't be both. And this, for our minds, our material minds, is impossible to accept. I am 
born in Japan and I am born in Germany. It's impossible. It's a contradiction. This is Achintya Beda Beda. We cannot understand it. And yet, it's true. The most common expression of this problem is in the fact that Krishna is independent of us and he is, in, he is everywhere in us. So we understand that we read many places that every jiva is part and parcel of Krishna. And yet Krishna is himself independent. Our minds cannot understand that both of these can be true. So we say it's achintya, inconceivable. A thing, a fruit cannot have the flavor of an apple and a mango at the same time. A sari cannot have the color of blue and red at the same time. A girl cannot have the qualities of being very tall and very short at the same time. It's one or the other. So if I say, here is a fruit, it's both an apple and a mango, then we cannot understand this. But what, le what we learn through bhakti is that these, that the problem is in our minds. It's not in our hearts. The problem that something cannot be an apple and a mango at the same time is an intellectual problem, a logical problem, a material problem. It's a problem for the material senses. But if we take away all the qualities that make an apple an apple, all the material qualities, the flavor and the color and the form, and take away what makes a mango a mango, the flavor and the color and the texture, we take away the shape, we take away the smell and how it feels on the outside, is there anything left? We take away all those things that let us know materially that it's a mango. Is there anything left? Yes. What is left is the soul of the fruit. What is left is what God tastes when she eats the fruit. What is left when all those material parts are taken away is the part that pleases God, the part that is divine, the part that we call prasadam, the part of the creation, the material creation, the part of that that pleases the creator. The spiritual, the spiritual mango, if you like. The mango that exists in the consciousness of God. What we also call the rasa, the juice of the mango, the spiritual juice of the mango. The part that we taste in our soul, the part that gives pleasure to Krishna, to the Divine.
So the mango that gives material pleasure. We all like to taste the mango. It's very nice on the tongue and very good to bite into. Well, why did God create mangoes? Mangoes exist, material mangoes exist in order to attract the heart of the jiva to it so that the jiva can discover the rasa within it, the spiritual flavor within it. All those pleasures in the creation are there to, to attract our hearts, to attract jiva hearts to Krishna. This is why the material creation is there, so that we can teach our souls to long for the spiritual. So we can teach our soul, the souls how to long, how to desire, how to want, how to taste. Because those are the only skills we need in the spiritual world. Desiring, longing, tasting. So this strange idea, achintya bedha bheda, is what makes all this possible. Because it's the, it's the place beyond the contradictions of our mind. In the soul, you know, there are no logical contradictions. There are no disagreements, there are no arguments. There are no rules, there are no uh, morality. There is no difference. Everything belongs together. So there's no beda, there's no difference, and there's no abeda, there's no sameness. All these things are in our minds, they're material. God doesn't have any problem with mangoes and apples. God doesn't have problems with thoughts because he is thought. God is emotion. God is heart and being and personality. So at the level of the soul, the apples and the mangoes, they're all together. And to prove this to you, we can do an experiment. Think, well, <clears throat> in my mind, it's impossible to be angry and happy at the same time. But in the heart, this is no problem at all. Feelings never contradict each other. Only intellectual thoughts. So I can say I'm happy and I'm angry and I'm uh, vulnerable and I'm confident and I'm shy and I'm afraid and I'm, <laughs> I'm courageous all at once. You know this. We can be all these things in our hearts. But if we try to tell this to our school teacher on an intellectual level, then we're in big trouble. There are no contradictions in the heart. There are only contradictions in the mind. And this is what we learn when we read and study the Vrindavan Leelas the, from Vilapa Kusmanjari. We see that the Radha has so many complex emotions. She's angry sometimes. She's nervous. She's shy. She's desiring. So many different 
emotions, and there's no contradiction between them. They all have one goal, and that is to please Ramon, to love Ramon. So, Vilapakus Manjari and the Radharaja Sudaniti, this is why Gurudev requests that we read them and read them and read them. It's because they show us the landscape of our hearts. They help us under, understand the shape of our souls. They cannot be understood with logic. They can only be understood, and even understood is the wrong word, they can only be experienced fully through the heart. Some things cannot be understood, they must be felt. And there's nothing else that Gurudev teaches us. The path of bhakti, the lessons of our Guru is to learn how to feel. We all went to, to school and learned how to think. Now we need to learn how to feel. And that is our education. That's the Bhakta, bhakta Mark. Okay, thank you for that parenthesis. I think that's an important point about sameness and difference. Now let's go back and see how Prabhupada continues his commentary. He continues by talking about the difference between worship in Vaikuntha and worship in Vrindavan. And he says this, there are innumerable Vaikuntha planets in the spiritual sky. And in all of them, the Lord accepts the service rendered by his eternal devotees in a reverential mood. So clearly in Vaikuntha, the place of the, the home of Vish, Vishnu, reverence, respect is necessary. The mood of Vaidhi is what is important in Vaikuntha. And so the devotees of Vishnu, the devotees of Vaikuntha, do their devotion in a mood of respect and reverence. But that is not our <coughs> mood. That is not our place. So Prabhupada says, therefore, Lord Shri Krishna presents his most confidential pastimes as he enjoys them in his transcendental realm. So Krishna is not in Vaikuntha. <clears throat> Krishna's pastimes happen in, in Vrindavan or in, we say, Goloka Vrindavan. And those pastimes are completely different than those that happen in <clears throat> In Vaikuntha. <clears throat> Vaikuntha pastimes, pastimes for the opulent Vishnu, are, um, are external. They're made to show, show our respect. But for Krishna, in Vrindavan, the pastimes are meant to experience feelings. So we have this difference that we see often in in our readings between devotion based on rules and fear and devotion based on spontaneous feeling. But what's 
completely different, <clears throat> well, another difference between these two, devotion from reverence and devotion from feeling, is that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu shows us. So you could say that Vishnu tells us, Narayan tells us what we must do to worship. <coughs> but Mahaprabhu shows us. He surrenders. He becomes the devotee. He becomes humble. And like we read in the verse, he becomes amazed at the things that come out of his heart. Oh my God, I can't believe I felt that, says God. That is surprising. So bhakti begins with God feeling. Bhakti begins with Lord, Chait uh, Lord Chaitanya because Lord Chaitanya is the God who discovers his own feelings, who discovers them. And he lets us watch while he's discovering them. So yes, we are supposed to realize that God is feeling emotions. But what is absolutely extraordinary is that God also realizes that he's feeling emotions. Chaitanya didn't know this was going to happen. He's Krishna and he didn't know it was going to happen. He's astonished by his own pastimes, says the verse. Astonishes himself again and again. And so now Prabhupada, let's see, Prabhupada tries to explain this, this astonishment, this surprise. He says, such pastimes are so attractive that they attract even the Lord. And thus, he relishes them in the form of Lord Chaitanya. So Prabhupada gives us such a wonderful explanation of this um, confidential reason for appearance. We've heard before, now in our class, but elsewhere too, we've heard that, well, Lord Chaitanya, Krishna appeared as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because he wanted to feel what Radha feels. But here it's put in a different way. He said, the pastimes of Radha and Krishna are so attractive that he wants to be, that he is attracted by them. They attract even the Lord. So he comes as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because he wants to be in those pastimes. He wants more of that, more of that pleasure, more of that love. So again, Krishna doesn't only preach, Chaitanya doesn't only preach that we must surrender. We all know this. He also does it. He is the divine who does not only um, talk about the divine, but he lives it out in all its passion. So like no other preacher, he shows what he says. In American, we say he doesn't only talk the talk, but he walks the walk. That means he does what he says. And so he shows us how to surrender. It's not, it's not a, it's not a dry concept, surrendering. He shows it. And all the acharyas in our sampradaya show it as well. 
In fact, that's how you can recognize a bona fide guru. It's one who lives the love and doesn't just talk about the love. Verse 29 now. Movishaya Gopi Ganara Upapati Bhave Yoga Maya Kari Karibeka Apana Prabhave. And Prabhupada translates like this The influence of Yoga Maya will inspire the gopis with the sentiment that I am their paramour their lover. So the influence of Yoga Maya, Yoga Maya, you remember, is the personal, internal energy of Krishna. And this will inspire the gopis with the sentiment that I am their paramour. Upapati bhave, this means as if I were their husband. Or their, their lover. So Krishna, by releasing, by giving up his internal energy, he uh, inspires the gopis to give up their internal energy, their love. So the yoga maya, the internal energy of Krishna flows to the gopis and their energy flows back to him. He uses his energy to put them in the mood of being his lover, to put it that way. But not out of self-interest. On the contrary, in order to bring them happiness. So he says, uh, Prabhupada says, now Yoga Maya is the name of the internal potency that makes the Lord forget himself and become an object of love for his pure devotee in different transcendental mellows. The Yoga Maya potency creates a spiritual sentiment in the minds of the damsels of Braj by which they think of Lord Krishna as their paramour. So it makes us wonder who is the boss here? Who is directing things? It's as though the internal energy of Krishna comes out and then takes over control. It makes Krishna forget himself and it makes the gopis feel love for him. When he's truly letting his internal self come out, he forgets he's God. He surrenders to his own internal energy. And what is that internal energy, of course? It's Radha Shakti. When he lets the energy of Radha come out, he forgets that he is God and he becomes the object of the love of others. He surrenders to love. He forgets that he was just dancing around in the Rasa Lila with the gopis. In the Rasa Lila, of course, he knows he's God and he's enjoying very much that all the gopis are in love with him. But here in the form of Chaitanya, he lets his inner potency out and he surrenders to that love. He gives up his power.
he says, they love me so much, these gopis, but I don't understand, what can that be like? And so he surrenders to the internal Radha Shakti, takes the mood of Radha, and he finds out what it is like to love Krishna. The gopis inspire him, he surrenders, and then he can relish himself. They inspire him to surrender. And this is a way that we can define bhakti. Another way, there are many ways. Bhakti is the name of service that makes Krishna surrender. Surrender to the love of Radha. And now Prabhupada is going to make a point about the difference between this spiritual surrender and the material surrender, everyday surrender, mundane surrender. He says, this sentiment, uh, sorry, this sentiment is never to be compared to mundane, illicit, sexual love. It has nothing to do with sexual psychology. Although the pure love of such devotees seems to be sexual. One should know for certain that nothing can exist in this cosmic manifestation that has no real counterpart in the spiritual field. A much simpler way of understanding this difference is to note that what is particular about uh, erotic pleasure, se sexual pleasure, is that it comes to a quick end. It stops. And indeed, it stops very rudely, very violently. This is a quality of material experience. The spiritual pleasure in Siddha Dei does not stop. It's endless. Indeed, it grows. So the distinction between the two should be very clear. Once again, it's not intended as some, some would say, as an argument against erotic pleasure in our mundane lives. It's an argument for realizing fully the difference. If we understand what is mundane and what is not, then we have already had an important realization. Because, and now Prabhupada continues, all material uh, manifestations are emanations of the transcendence. So they come from transcendence. Material bodies, material desires are also created by Krishna. So they have their role to play. And like I said before, their role is to teach us spiritual longing. Or we could call this a different, a new example of Beda Bede, Beda Beda, sorry. Um, all erotic sentiments are divine, but they are different as well. They come from the creation, but they are not spiritual. So our task is to understand, to realize 
the relationship between our bodily lives and our souls. Because they are related, but this relation is a very uh, difficult one to understand. How much of what we feel is divine and how much of it is material? How much of my happiness on the birthday party of my daughter is ego and how much is it coming from my soul? These are the questions that require lots and lots of reflection, meditation and experience. Verse 30. Amiha na jani taha na jane gopigana dunhara rupa gune danara nitya haramana. That's very sweet. Neither the gopis nor I shall notice this. For our minds will always be entranced by one another's beauties and qualities. So it says, Amiha na janita taha. I don't know that. Amina. I. Na jani. I don't know that. Na jani gopigana. The gopis don't know that either. None, none, neither of us knows. For our minds, our manna, will always, nitya, be entranced. The words hare, which means stolen, our minds will always be stolen by our beauty, one another's beauty and qualities, rupa gune. So the beauty of the gopis and the beauty of Krishna is so great that we don't even understand. And that is where we want to be. Krishna doesn't know what's happening. The gopis don't know what's happening. The, the attraction of their forms, their rupa and their qualities, their gune, is too great. So that their feelings become more powerful than their thoughts. This is the point. There is nothing to know, there is only to feel. I know nothing, they know nothing, it's all in our feelings, what we feel. Your soul is so beautiful to me that I want to know nothing more about your material qualities. Prabhupada says, in the spiritual sky, the Vaikuntha planets are predominated by Narayana. So predominated means they're the top, uh, the boss is Narayana. So Vaikuntha is the, the planet of Vishnu and Narayana is the, the, the creator, the opulent, uh, master, powerful, creator. And he dominates in Vaikuntha. Prabhupada says, his devotees, so Narayan's devotees, have the same features he does. And the exchange of devotion there is on the platform of reverence. So Prabhupada is saying there's a there can also be devotion which is based only on reverence, on respect and fear. We can have devotion to Narayan, he says. But that is not what bhaktas understand as devotion. Devotion that's based on feeling. And he goes on, Prabhupada now, and says, sorry, da, da, da. But above all these Vaikuntha planets is Goloko, Goloka. 
Oh, Krishna Loka. So Vrindavan Loka. Goloko Vrindavan, sorry. Where the original personality of Godhead Krishna fully manifests his pleasure potency in free loving affairs. So Goloka is Vrindavan. And there he lets the pleasure potency, the embodied by Radharani, come out and he lives out his pastimes, his leelas there. So it's in Goloka where Radharani becomes visible, the internal spiritual energy of, of God. And Prabhupada goes on, since the devotees in the material world know almost nothing about these affairs, the Lord desires to show these affairs to them. And again, before, the key word here is show. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is there to show, not to only tell through preaching and, and books, but to show. The only way to fully communicate devotion is by showing. And what does that mean? Showing means being. The only way to show that you're a devotee is to be a devotee. You cannot put on the clothes and the makeup and learn about the dance and the songs and the poetry from the books. You must be it. Even more important, you must realize that you are it. Everyone, every soul is a natural devotee. Every soul, every svarup is a natural bhakta. Our only difficult difficulty is to realize this. Realize what it means. And that says, realize what we are. So yes, I can have a beautiful sari, which I wear when I go to Mungir Mandir. I can have the skills of playing some musical instruments. I can have some nice skills of food making. I can have memories of my, of the prayers and the songs. All these things we can have. We can go down to the bhakti shop in uh, Loi Bazaar in Vrindavan and buy all these things. And then we have them. Put them in our suitcase and bring them back home. But that's not the point. The point is what we are. And to be what we are, we need no Sorry, we need no special paraphernalia. We need only to realize our own soul. So being a devotee, being a bhakta doesn't mean acting or taking what we need in order to fill, fulfill the role. It means being ourselves. It means clearing away the blockages to being ourselves. It means, it means essentially a, a passive consciousness. Gurudev says, viewer, not doer. It means, and that means understanding that we are not the masters of the world. We're not even the masters of our lives. We are instruments in the very best of worlds. We are 
instruments that let the love of Radharani flow. That is our highest calling, our highest task. The greatest devotee is the one where we can see that she is letting love flow. Not that she has all the love, but that she lets the love flow. Where you can see that there's no other purpose in her life but to let the, the, the love of the divine flow through her. So what's difficult for us as tzaddikas is to remove the obstacles, to clear away the rubble, clear, clear away the, the garbage, and to let that, that emotion flow as it is meant to. <clears throat> 